Welcome to the Essex jungle, a unique habitat renowned for its exotic species and rare birds of paradise. But there's another jungle, behind the front doors of ordinary people's homes, where some of the world's wildest and most dangerous animals lurk. 30,000 exotic animals imported into Essex every year. In this series, we meet the people who own them. Some people think they're disgusting, but they look lovely when they're eating. I've been bitten left, right and centre, to your Burmese, to the boas. You can't stroke a fish. Why would you have a fish? The people who sell them... Uh, they're quite soppy. People in Essex are just being brave, I suppose. These are lethal weapons. You know, these can kill people. And the people who rescue them. Some of these animals should never have ever been pets. And this is one of them. Essex has always been wild. You just didn't know how wild. Coming up in this episode... The moment that door gets unlocked, everything stops, everyone's concentrating. A rattlesnake's dangerous dinner. If you were bitten, what would happen to you? It'd probably make you want to go and jump in front of the first bus. Quite pervy, this really, isn't it? A bearded dragon looking for love. Match made in heaven. <laughs> Relax, Hector, have a nice bath. And a lizard living in the lap of luxury. Sport rot, eh? Hey? the little town of Great Wakering in Essex. One man is on a crusade to save the county's unwanted exotic animals. Ian Newby runs a sanctuary for animals that are more used to the jungle, but have found themselves in the wilds of the home counties. I have a passion for wildlife. I've been working with animals for 30 years now. Ian grew up on a game reserve in South Africa. Vicky. And spent many years working in zoos around the UK. Dwarf is the dangerous wild animal rescue facility. We're here for abandonment, for escapees. Our doors are pretty much open to anything. And with over 70 wild animals currently living in the sanctuary, Ian's busier than ever. To the right here, we've got a pair of bearded dragons. Uh, we've got a couple of raw pythons here, a chameleon up here, found on the road in Benfleet, a Russian rat snake here, a northern pine snake in this one. Hyacian boa, one of the rarest snakes in the world, found on a doorstep in Basildon. Behind me, another pair of bearded dragons. I had to rescue one 40 feet up a tree in a graveyard in Chelmsford. We've got a brown-headed parrot, a Senegal parrot, an albino African clawed frog. Iguana had to leave its home because the lady was having a baby. Why do you have to blame the children for getting rid of pets and not giving them a good chance? Three leopard geckos up here. Underneath we've got scorpions, a corn snake below that, another one below that one. Another bearded dragon here, another bearded dragon here. We're in flux with bearded dragons at the moment. Californian king snake and another bearded dragon yet again. Back to the garden, to Beaky's enclosure. Hello, darling. Hi. She won't do anything. <laughs> Ian's house isn't just crammed with exotic animals. We've got gates all over the house, really. You have to have some security. Hey, shush! He and his wife, Lisa, have six kids under the age of seven. Harry, shush! Get out of that cupboard. Get on there. Harry, pee pipe, sit quietly, watch the telly. George, down. George, sit and watch the telly. Mummy will tell you. It's good fun. It's um, it's hectic and it's very busy, but if you're prepared to put the work in, it's lovely. It's a, it's a lovely environment to be in and it's a lovely environment for the children to grow up in. They absolutely adore it. And if six kids and 70 exotic pets wasn't enough, Ian and Lisa also have four dogs and a cat. As you can see, it's not a normal house here in Essex, but this is home. Ian gets around 20 calls a week from people looking to offload exotic pets. Today, he's heading off on a typical rescue mission. Um, off to Dartford uh, this morning. I've had a call from some, a concerned pet owner who's got a boa constrictor, and apparently it's tried to kill him twice. 
all I'm taking with me is a snake hook because I don't want to get bitten. <laughs> a duvet cover so that he's nice and comfortable and a box to carry him in. As Ian heads off to Dartford, up the coast in Leon Sea, Rob Yeldham and his wife Trish are getting ready for work in their pet shop, Scales and Fangs. I kept cats and dogs for years, and then one of my neighbours actually, she had a royal python, showed me the snake. I was like, wow, she's fantastic. And literally within a week I'd end up buying me, me first snake, and then my second and third and fourth, and then I wanted more and more reptiles, but in my kitchen just weren't big enough. The shop has capacity for over 450 snakes and reptiles. But for Rob, deadly animals are a piece of cake compared to his last job. I worked for London Underground. <laughs> the ghastly tube. Animals are much easier than people. When you've, you've got a, a spitting cobra in your hand, you expect to get spat at, but not when you're at work on the underground. That's just vile, and that's happened before. So yeah. Good riddance. Scales and Fangs is a family business. Rob's wife, Trish, is his right-hand woman. So who do you think works hardest in this business? Trish. Without a doubt. What are you doing there, Trish? Cleaning up poo. <laughs> is that your special job? That's my special job, yeah. And the only one who does it properly. Every week, Rob and Trish have to clean out more than 250 tanks. It's not just a dirty job, it's potentially very dangerous. So if you get a bit of adrenaline going? Every single time, I'm going to go purple in a minute, no <laughs> doubt. It's not nerves, it is adrenaline. It is just excitement, I think. Native to southwestern America and Mexico, rattlesnakes are among the most dangerous reptiles in the world. I always have someone standing by, normally Trish, um, just in case he decides to shoot off one way and she's always there with a hook just to grab him back. So, job done. Coming up, Rob dices with death at feeding time. It won't kill you straight away, but the amount of pain is phenomenal. And Ian comes face to face with a deadly boa. He's completely engulfed my head. What's going through your mind? Get him off quick. Ian Newby from exotic animal rescue group Dwarf is on his way to Dartford to adopt a boa constrictor that its owner can no longer control. The only defence a snake that size has got is obviously to either bite, strike at you, or crush, squeeze you. For Ian, it's all in a day's work. I've never exactly been scared of one of these animals at all. I do, uh, catching an eight-foot alligator, yeah, I'll get, um, you know, jumping in my stomach, I'll get nervous about it the day before, but worst scenario with a boa constrictor, um, I'm, I might get bitten and it'll hurt, but it won't kill me. Whereas something like an alligator could take my leg off or my head off. So, you know, I've got no problems at all. Today, Ian is dealing with a situation of the utmost gravity. I'm Greg and uh, this is Sirius. Greg from Dartford got his boa constrictor Sirius five years ago. I think it was about a foot long, um, an inch or so wide. He was, in fact, he was smaller than that. He was tiny. He's pushing about nine foot now. Weighs an absolute ton. Um, he's, he's a big old lad. As Sirius has grown, he's become more difficult and dangerous to handle. I've got him out for cleaning and just general maintenance on the tank. I've put him around my shoulders um, and within seconds really he's done what a snake does and just rather than go down my body and wrap around my body he's wrapped around my head um, so that that occasion he wrapped quicker than i could get him off so 
I've put my kind of hand here just to save me, well, getting choked type thing, um, and it's completely engulfed my head. So with the other hand, I'm looking for his towel to try and unravel him, and as I'm unraveling him with his towel, he's looping back round again. What was going through your mind? <laughs> Get him off quick. <laughs> Get him off as quick as I can. <laughs> It's time for Ian to get to grips with Sirius. Fully grown boas weigh around 60 pounds and can crush and swallow whole large mammals like sheep and pigs. How are you doing? Nice Ian. to meet you. Brilliant. Yeah, last, how are you doing? Do you no come problem. In? Yes, yeah. Fantastic. Let's come and have a look. Everything looks like he's in good condition. He's got some weight to him. Oh, he's, he's well looked after, well fed, well watered, all and that kind of stuff. the reason you're getting rid of him? He's kind of, yeah, if, if you like, got the better of me a couple of times, so that was a bit of a, a bummer. Right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just see if I can get him out and see if he does act nasty. Ian uses all his 30 years of experience to coax Sirius out of his tank. It's all right, fella. There. There's a good lad, aren't you? There we are. Now let's have a look. Ah. Right, could you do me a favour and open the duvet? Yeah. Got away a good turn off stone. Yeah, he's a boy. Yeah, in you go, fella. Sirius is put into a duvet cover to keep the light out and stress to a minimum. You've made the right choice. If it's too big to handle, you lose your confidence, that's yeah. the time to get rid of it. Yeah, that's, that's for sure. It. With Sirius safely in the box, it's another textbook job from Ian. Just slide him in. That's great. Thank you very much. OK. Oh, well done. Cheers, yeah. pal. Thank you. See you later. Thank you. Cheers. Thank Cheers. you. All right. See you later. He needs to go. You know, that's the whole idea why we're doing this. So, in a way, kind of pleased. But obviously, he's my pet, he's my boy. So, it'll be more of a case probably tomorrow, when he's not here, that I'll think, oh, he's gone. Sirius will be rehoused with Ian before finding a new permanent home. Just across the Essex border, in the small town of Strood, one man has spent the past 22 years transforming his small bungalow into a haven for exotic animals. Sorry we're late, gentlemen. 64-year-old Chris Weller has lived here since he was seven years old. Well, this room used to be my bedroom when I was a little boy. My first bedroom. <laughs> well, the one thing I never used to do was put in here. <laughs> For former prison guard Chris, exotic animals have always been the ideal inmates. It was about 89, 90 when I started getting into parrots and to reptiles simply because I wanted someone to come home to. Because A, they're, they're company and I find them easy to get on with. They're also easy to keep this type of animal. It's far easier to keep than perhaps a dog or a cat. As time has gone on, Chris's bungalow has become home to ever more exotic species. Oh, we're not, no, we're not having that game. No, no, he's gone up on the... Come on. Come on. Caesar, Caesar. Come on. Caesar, come on. No, not naughty, come on. Caesar, go on. Oh, here we come. He's, he's, he's got the message. He's, he's quite clever. Come on. Come on. Chris has owned Caesar, his four and a half foot long Cayman crocodile, since 2007. Cat flat. Cat flat. Cat flat. Come on. Not door. Come on, you've done cat flat before. There you go. Oh, now you can go through, can't you? You're not amused, are you? Come on, come on. Good boy.
Good boy. I like having him because obviously being a, a crocodilian species, it's nice to know you've got one. And he is quite, we like to say affectionate for the wrong word, but it's a mutual respect between the two species. Uh, and that's how it should be. A fully grown caiman has a bite force of 2,000 pounds per square inch, enough to rip through flesh and bone. But Chris treats Caesar like any other pet. I used to hold him initially, but he wasn't particularly keen on being held. He wasn't too sure what my intentions were, but I don't do that anymore now. Why did you stop handling him? Being bitten. <laughs> it's the biggest motivator. You know, he's obviously, he wasn't happy being picked up. He didn't mind being stroked, he didn't want to be picked up. Can't even see the scar there. Yeah? Don't even which hand it was now. Yeah? It's all killed up. I not there now. Yeah. Was it painful? Yeah, yeah, it was painful. It was quite a bit. <laughs> Chris will have to keep his wits about him. As, fully grown, Caesar could reach seven feet in length. Trish, you ready? Trish? Back in Leon C. Trish! Rob and Trish are getting ready to feed their 150 hungry house guests. Four large, three medium. Four large mice again. Seven large. Seven large. Three medium. Two medium. Three. It's snake feeding day today, so I've got to go around every enclosure, write down what the snake is and what size food it's going to eat. Get all the food out of the freezer and then let it thaw out for a few hours. Rob and Trish's freezer is packed full of 700 different sized rodents for their snakes to snack on. Earlier on I wrote down what snakes in what tank and what it eats. So now all I need to do is open the tank up, look on this nice messy chart and corn snake needs a large mouse, which is so. The first snake to get its dinner is the corn snake. Rob moves the mouse around to trick the snake into thinking that the mouse is still alive. got its body constricted around the, the body of the rodent, it's feeling for the animal to die basically. So as soon as it realises that there's no heartbeat and the animal's dead and it's not going to put up a fight, it will start eating, which it's done already. It's never nice to see another animal getting eaten. So ideally it'd be nice to see all animals vegetarian, but you know, they eat mice and rats. So you have to separate yourself. You have to sort of just look at the rodents as just being a, a dinner, that's it. You know, nothing other than food. This is quite an aggressive snake actually, so we certainly don't want fingers in there. This baby Burmese python is only about a foot long, but will grow to over 12 feet in length. There's two pythons in there. And I've taken this one out to feed it separately. Now the reason for that is if the other one finished its food before this one, then the other one could come over and try and start eating this one's dinner. Now it's one, it's one food item, so you'll have one snake one end, one snake the other, and they'll both be chomping on either end of the rodent until they meet in the middle. Someone's got to give in and one will end up getting eaten and they could both end up dying from that. So you never feed. Never feed snakes in the same tank. After two hours, Rob has fed almost all of his 150 snakes. The last to be fed is the only venomous snake in the shop. The rattlesnake's venom can kill with a single bite, so Rob treats it with the utmost respect. If it means not changing the water bowl for a day, then I won't change the water bowl for a day. It's going to hurt him less than it hurt me to get bitten. The moment that door gets unlocked for that, that, that rattlesnake tank, everything stops. Rattlesnakes have a deadly venom that destroys human tissue 
shuts down organs and causes major blood clotting. It'd probably make you want to go and jump in front of the first bus. Extremely painful, it won't kill you straight away. It'd probably take, to take up you know, hours and hours to actually kill you, but the amount of pain um, and discomfort that you, you suffer in the meantime is phenomenal. Very, very nasty, very, very nasty bite. Rattlesnakes can move faster than the human eye, so Rob has no margin for error. So have you got a plan, Rob, if you do get bitten by the rat? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, check the bus timetable. <laughs> the closest antivenom to here would be in London Tropical School of Medicine. I and mean, I believe London Zoo would also keep an antivenom for this particular species. But let's hope we don't need that. <laughs> let's hope not, because they are both over 40 miles away. Now obviously I need to keep these keep the food item much further away from my hand than I did with the other snakes. Because obviously if this thing strikes for the rodent and misses and comes straight past straight past the rodent, it can end up latching onto the back of my hand. So I'll use something that is much, much longer, such as this. The rattlesnake vibrates the rattle at the end of its tail as a warning device when it feels under threat. When a rattlesnake strikes, its fangs unfold from the roof of its mouth. The fangs act like hypodermic needles to inject the venom into the prey. We've got our own little camera thing going on over it. Yeah, go on boy. With the rat fully consumed, the rattlesnake won't have to eat again for another four days. Coming up, a bearded dragon looking for a mate. He's never had a girlfriend, so it could be very interesting. <laughs> and Rocky the Iguana comes out to play. No, no, you're not attacking anyone's equipment. South End on Sea, sometimes known as the Essex Riviera. A seaside getaway for millions. And also home to 60-year-old mother of four, Jackie Lewis. She shares her house with six rabbits, two cats, and a labradoodle. But lately, Jackie only has eyes for reptiles. Started getting interested in lizards, I suppose, about, about four years or so ago. I got, um, now, behave. They're just so different, they're just so fascinating. They're just like little dinosaurs. How can you not like something like that? Jackie hasn't always enjoyed the best fortune with her scaly housemates. I got a leopard tail gecko first. Unfortunately, it died. And I got another one. And that one died. And that kind of put me off for a short time. So I thought, we've got to leave those and we go to bearded dragons. Three years ago, Jackie got a pair of bearded dragons, Sebastian and Medusa, and had high hopes that they would mate. But all was not as it seemed. Didn't lay any eggs or anything like that. A year later or so, found out that Medusa wasn't a girl, she was a boy. Which is quite unusual because normally two male beardies don't get on very well together. Unfortunately, my other one died. No, you could stay away. Stay away. Today's a big day for Sebastian, as Jackie has arranged for him to go on a hot date. No, Coco. Out the way. Move. He really went quite funny when the other one died. He was just sitting around doing nothing. He wouldn't go on his logs. He wouldn't do anything. He wasn't eating. I was a bit worried about him, actually, but he'll, he'll definitely be a lot better with someone else. He's never had a girlfriend, so uh, it could be very interesting. <laughs> She's asked John, who runs her local exotic pet shop, Smooth and Scaly, to find Sebastian a mate. This one's for Jackie. Uh, we're just going to try and see if this gets on with her uh, male. 
if I was to put this female in there, he'd run around like a lunatic, uh, make his throat go solid black and puff it right out. Bearded, the thing called the bearded dance, the females will lift up their hands and they do like a little wave to the male and then he'll start doing really hard head bopping. Yeah, he should start nodding there. There you go. So Jackie wants to get another partner for hers, you think yep. it's a good thing? Oh yeah, definitely. He's been a bit miserable, so we'll put a female in there. He'll do like that one, he'll bang his head and run around like a lunatic and she'll sit there waving and teasing him all day long. And hopefully Jackie can breed them and get some babies. Jackie arrives at Smooth and Scaly with Sebastian. Oh God, she looks a lot smaller, doesn't she? There's no time for formalities. He's thrown straight in with Mystique, the female dragon, and expected to perform. Quite pervy, this really, isn't it? <laughs> Standing here waiting for something to happen. Sebastian's finally in the presence of a female, but he doesn't seem interested. He hasn't moved, really. It is all on him. He's pretending he doesn't care, but he obviously does. Or he plays for the other team. <laughs> oh, don't, don't, because he was in with, a, with another male, wasn't he? Yeah. The two of them grew up together. Do you ever get gay lizards, John? <laughs> uh, so you do, actually, yeah, sometimes. Sometimes the male gets confused and you pin them down, or like uh, with, the, with the chameleons. Um, I've had a male um, opposite another male, and he turned pink, um, pretending to be a female. Same with Sebastian, with, with um, my other one. They used to go through all the motions. Showing off, doing the hip-hop, the black, wave the black fa Yeah, they used to do that all the time. And they used to jump on each other. I never thought of it that way. No, I'm sure it's not that. Give him a little leather hat. No. Unperturbed by Sebastian's lack of interest, Jackie packs the two dragons up and takes them home for a second try. <laughs> 40 miles to the south in Strood, Former prison officer Chris Weller has spent the past three hours feeding and watering his 16 exotic housemates. Now it's time for a refreshing bath. Yeah, I'm just going to fill the bath up a little bit with some warm water. Because Rocky's going to have a little bath for a start. This encourages him to go toilets. You haven't got to worry about it for the rest of the day. Once he's done it for the day, that's it. So you, you know, so I do. He can do his in there, and that's. And who, who's Rocky? Rocky, the big one, the nasty one. Iguana Rocky is known as the bad boy of the house. So over the years, Chris has had to resort to extreme measures to keep him in check. We had the naughty room made for him to be put in when he misbehaved. It was just an area, like when I work, I suppose it's a bit of going back to my prison days, the segregation unit. It's like having a separate place to put someone that were misbehaving and they have to go in there and they quieten down and then come out again. So we're going to get him out now. He's quite aggressive, but once you get hold of him, he's, he's okay. He's got to watch you don't put your hand over the front of his face, because that'll give him too much an opportunity. You use it as well, aren't you? <sighs> Come on, it's toilet time. Hopefully it calm him down. Yeah. While he's in here having a nice warm bath, I can just tidy his room up. He's not in my way, he doesn't go for me or any. I can just get on with his room. As Rocky is without a female companion, Chris has had to find him alternative playmates. Rocky did have a partner, Susie, for many, many years, but Susie died and uh, he's been on his own ever since. So to keep him occupied, I've given him this. 
He thinks it's a lady lizard. <laughs> but uh, as I say, it's one of his little toys. He bites it, hangs under it, lays on it. But he, he sometimes, if he's in a bad mood, he will shake it and wiggle it about in his mouth. But uh, it might be frustration, I don't know, but it keeps him occupied. You being a naughty boy. Come on, Rocky. You can go back to your room now. You can go back on your own. Go on, then. Now, don't you come in out and chasing me. No, no. Go on, off we go. No, no, you're not attacking anyone's equipment. No, come on. Give me a little start. He usually calms up on his own. With Rocky washed and scrubbed, it's feeding time. And for Chris, 100% concentration is vital. Iguanas are native to Central and South America. They have very sharp teeth, which are capable of tearing human flesh. Now, Rocky just suddenly did one of his soppy stages where he wants to be hand-fed. Now, where there is in the back of his mind, there's a great opportunity to get a finger as well as a satsuma, I don't know. And you have to be a bit careful with this. I don't mind, but I don't know where's the trick on his part because he's rather cunning. What have we got? Oh, look. Do you eat it or not? You've got to be very careful because he can suddenly decide that his fingers he likes, not, not satsumas. Very yeah, good. When I make up the food, I make it a little bit longer now, so I can stick a bit more in and keep my fingers on the outside rather than on the inside. But, as you can see, this is his tender side, and this is his, sometimes he's a softy, really. He acts a big boy when he's walking about, but he can be quite pleasant on occasion when it suits him. While Chris and Rocky are getting on famously, back in South End, Jackie Lewis is waiting for her bearded dragon, Sebastian, and his new female companion, Mystique, to fall for each other. <laughs> no movement whatsoever. <sighs> but much to Jackie's disappointment, there's still no sign of romance. Get down. Let's go give him some bugs. They're too small. You get your face out. She decides a romantic meal of bugs might get the juices flowing. He's more interested in food. It's as if she wasn't in there, to be honest. Might be different later, once they've sorted, sorted themselves out. Can't expect instant success. Basically, you have to leave them, I suppose, to get on with it. Just as Jackie is giving up hope for a love match, Sebastian and Mystique start getting in the mood. Oh. <laughs> when the male lizard is aroused, he bobs his head violently and his neck turns black. He's definitely getting blacker and blacker underneath his chin. The female waves her front leg in response. Never seen a beardy dragon do that before. So strange. I think we're definitely on to a winner. With the body language looking promising, Jackie just has to hope that Sebastian will follow through on the flirtation and mate. Match made in heaven. Jackie could be hearing the pitter-patter of tiny claws within just four weeks. Coming up, Chris introduces the jewel in his exotic animal crown. Sorry I'm late, Hector. You've been a good boy. And Ian rescues a mistreated lizard. It's emaciated, really. It's very, very thin.
In the small town of Stroud, 63-year-old Chris Weller has spent more than two decades collecting a menagerie of exotic companions, including Caesar, the Cayman crocodile, and Rocky, the iguana. Now he's preparing to unveil his pride and joy. Sorry I'm late, Hector. You've been a good boy. When Chris bought water monitor Hector in 1999, he was just two feet long. Since then, he's grown to over six feet. Come on then, you're a good boy. He was once in a shop in a, in a vivarium somewhere in London, and he escaped out of that. He didn't want to be in a tank, and he got out and he ate some of the stock in the shop and they had to move him. It was obvious to me right from the start that I'm going to have to get him something better than a large tank. And that's when we gave him his first room. And when I opened the door to let him out for the first time, he ran past me like a sprinter, shot past me, stopped, and thought, he's let me out. He looked up at me as if to say, what's all that about? And from that moment on, he could come and go as he wanted. Now it's toilet time. It'd be a good boy. What do we do when we come in here? We go to the toilet. I try to get him to do it in a controlled circumstance where I can pick it up and clean it up straight away. It's easy to pick up off a lino, see, and then scrub it down. It's easier rather than do it on the carpet. Come on, you didn't do one well yesterday. And you've had something to eat since then. Here we go, tail going up. Stand by. Good boy. Oh, oh, that's nice. Thank you, Hector. That's a good boy. You are a good boy. You're a good boy now. Cool. Oh, here. Oh, yeah. Right. I'll go wipe that up now. Yeah. There we go. Water monitors are native to Asia, but Chris feels Hector's more than at home in this corner of England. He's got used to living in human company. He's not now living in the wild. He realises, hmm, this ain't a bad thing here. Yeah? You know, I get people giving me food, I get all I want, I don't have to do anything for it. Just sit and look pretty. And he does it very well. Pull yourself in, and up we go. The next part of Hector's routine involves soaking in a warm bath. I keep telling him, all those poor lizards in Thailand they have to sit in silly old rivers in cold water and... Sport rot, eh? <laughs> Relax, Hector, have a nice bath. Chris treats Hector like royalty, even down to hand-feeding him prawns while he bathes. What's this, Hector? What daddy got you here? Look. <laughs> ah! You like that, don't you? Hey, look at that in Thailand. Someone said to him, why are you living on, in rocks and on twigs? I said, our ancestors probably slept in caves 23,000 years ago. I said, but you wouldn't want to live on one now, would you? He's realised this is better, I want to live here. And that's why he goes and sits on his bed. I don't force him to go and sit on his bed at night. That's where he goes. And I said, he's been living on a nice soft bed with covers and everything and a pillow. I said, why would he want to go and live on locks and twigs when he can have that? And there's no answer to that. Hector's room includes all the modern conveniences the average urban lizard could possibly need, including a personal pool, sun deck and heat lamp. But that's not all. He's also got his own portable TV set. He spends a lot of time just sitting there. So I thought, well, perhaps he might want something to watch. So we put a little portable TV in, he doesn't watch it, he doesn't watch it. He's what you got to bear in mind, we ain't got to hunt food all day because the food's given to him. And he's got more time on his hands. So we give him a TV set to have a look at. And when they get, otherwise they get bored, you know. And uh, Hector's got a remote control as well? Yeah, well, how's he going to change the set if he didn't have it? He's now got a place where he can actually live a life he wants to lead. But is that wrong for them to have it? I don't think so. I think they've gained rather than lost. Uh, they live a lot longer than probably what they would do in the wild because in the wild they've also got the unfortunate thing of predation. 
and they've been eaten by another animal. So, I mean, where is it safer to be? Back in Great Wakering at Ian Newby's exotic animal shelter, Ian and his assistant Sam are getting acquainted with their newest arrival. It's got some weight, hasn't it? It's lovely. Sirius, the boa constrictor, had tried to crush its previous owner. You can feel the strength yeah. of them, but they're a strong animal, you know? Sirius's previous owner had him for five years and always presumed he was male. However, Ian has made a surprising discovery. Do you know what? This is not a male, this is a female. Is it? Yeah. You can just see two little tiny spurs. Now, the spurs on a male boa constrictor of this size would be showing at least half a centimetre. These are barely showing at all. Ian will ensure Sirius the lady boa is happy with human contact before rehousing her with a new owner. I can't see her being a problem. No. Nice snake. Hello. Every week, Ian gets dozens of phone calls from exotic pet owners looking to offload their animals. If you want to bring it down, we'll look after it. We'll take it off. Yeah. You're looking at about a 25 minute trip. See you shortly. All right. Bye. That's another call for another bearded dragon. Not that I need another bearded dragon here. I've got 15 at the moment, all needing homes. Apparently no one can touch it without it biting them. Uh, he says it's a female. Females generally aren't aggressive, but I won't know until I actually see the animal. Bearded dragons are popular in the UK due to their non-aggressive nature. Within the hour, the dragon arrives. All right. OK, I'll do my best. Well, cheers, thanks a lot. All right. Cheers. And Ian immediately notices a problem. She's quite thin, isn't she? Hello, darling. Oh, she's very underweight. Yeah, see, there's no weight there on the, the legs. This is just bone. These legs should be nice, big, fat legs. All right, darling. I can't see any aggression there at the moment. We're going to just try and obviously get some weight back on her, get her warmed up in a proper environment. I mean, this cage is covered in excrement everywhere. This doesn't look like it's even had anyone clean it up for the last six months. It's diabolical. I mean, nobody in their right mind would like to live in that themselves. It's like sticking me in a room the size of this office and leaving me here without a toilet and without proper food and care. And so I have to literally crap in the corner and live in my own shit. That's what's happened here. It's this diabolical. When I see an animal that's been mistreated, I have to bite my lip sometimes. But the best thing is, is to just get that animal signed over, get it into a proper environment, and then get it a good life. Next time on Essex Jungle, we meet the man whose escaped snake struck fear into the community. Half the population of Essex was panicking, really. The snake was on the loose, boa constrictor, one of those scary things. A power cut at Ian's means it's life or death for the animals. If you don't warm these animals up, they're going to have problems. Very, very cold again. Let's get them straight in. And love is in the air for Hector. How would you like to meet a young lady lizard? 